episode of the brothers trek about star trek edition or star trek edition of course <laughs> what are we even talking about here today folks i don't know but we're gonna be talking about episode 13 <laughs> what's past his prologue it's a great title we'll talk about it in a minute but as always we're gonna do introductions first my name is matt coming to you live from austin and from planet Houston is my brother Ken. Say hello, Ken. Peace and long life. We are back to talk about what's past this prologue. A clever name because uh, everything we find out about to our uh, friends and foes in this episode is all uh, basically ex- exposition. From uh, from what has happened before the show even started. So it's a lot of fun, to, and we'll be diving into all of that and more as we dive into the episode. A couple of questions I had coming into this episode were, uh, you know, what happened to our Lok- Lorca? Out, and what happened to Mir Burnham? Which we also didn't find out. I thought we'd get a little, like, side thing. I thought for a moment maybe Lorca had killed Burnham or something, but uh, we didn't get any of that information. Uh, does that bug you, and do we need to know that, Ken? That's a good question. Hmm. Well, I try sometimes. I think, you know, by keeping it open, by keeping it mysterious, there is always the possibility that they turn up again, soap opera like. <laughs> Fair. When we least expect them. I have a feeling that we may see Lorca again. But again, we'll get to it when we get there. So uh, with all of that said, I'm going to say let's just get to it because we got a bunch to talk about in this episode here. Captain's log. Starting. It's five-year mission. So the first thing we find is that uh, there's no cold open. We just jump right into the credits this week. And after the credits, we, uh, oh, during the credits, we find that this week's episode was written by everyone's new favorite co-producer, Ted Sullivan. If you all have been watching After Trek, then you know Ted Sullivan is just a font of awesome information when it comes to Discovery. As well, uh, I posted a thing on our Facebook page about some Star Trek-related tweets he's been doing, so you should follow him on Twitter because he's been throwing out a lot of cool stuff like that. Like, for instance, we haven't seen the engine room. The Spore Drive uh, exists in the uh, Spore Lab. And that we have not even met our chief of engineering, which I think is also uh, very interesting. One of the things that he he talked about on After Trek was that one of the that fans have made is that we are accustomed to seeing a bridge crew function as a bridge crew, interact as a bridge crew. And there hasn't been a lot of that. Mm-hmm. There's been a lot of off the bridge stuff. There's been this focus on people who aren't really part of the bridge crew properly. And he said that's because we wanted to build the bridge crew as the show went on. And it's only really now, after this episode, when we see, um, you know, Saru looking at this, you know, station and looking at that station. And they're all looking back and, you know, they're, you know the eye contact and that we're really establishing this is a bridge crew. And yeah. that, you know, going forward, we can expect a more normal Star Trek. But that was something they were building toward, you know, getting the band, you know, together kind of a thing rather than giving us a, a crew that's, you know, been working together for a couple of years. And now we get to see them just doing their stuff. 
Yeah. Well, also, too, we had to deal with the fact that, you know, Lorca is from a different universe, you know, where he's not even used to the way the Starfleet bridge functions. So, you know, he's we're dealing with a guy who's like, I'm doing everything so I can get back home and destroy an emperor. That's everything I'm doing plans on that. And even in the little bit I got to see of After Trek this week, you know, uh, Jason Isaac basically says that, you know, like his whole plan. And yes, the Klingon war helped him in a respect because it gave him some kind of autonomy once uh, he was able to take over the discovery. So I thought all of that was really interesting as well. Uh, another thing too, I thought was interesting that uh, he had tweeted out last week was uh, digitally in the writer's room uh, when Brian Fuller was uh, still on as EP of the show that they were going to jump into the mirror universe earlier, but that they decided the writer's room decided that uh, maybe we should live with the core group a little bit longer, get to know who they are in this universe before we go to their counterparts and show you like, dark side of them are you know writing. writing so the show opens with uh Lorca uh it was the scene if you watched after Trek last week it was the little scene they showed uh showed from this week's episode uh 212 days of torture we find is how long they've been going at it Although later they said it had been two years, so I'm kind of confused what the number was, but I think it, he said 212 days of torture. Uh, we welcome back Commander Landry. She's not looking very good. <laughs> um, obviously, she's been, you know, 212 days of the agonizer boot, so I don't blame her. She says, uh, I thought you were dead. Lorca says, you didn't believe them, did you? And she said, not for a minute. He says, I've been to another universe back. You don't think that I don't have a plan? So they go in search of the ISS Stamets next. Uh, Landry thinks that he's ran, but it turns out that he's uh, cloaked um, cleverly. We also find out here, and importantly, that Stamets is the one who sold Lorca and his group out in the coup attempt. And uh, I was thinking, uh, does that seem bold for Stamets, or does that seem right on par? You know, I can kind of see... Are Stamets leaning both ways, feeling like the right thing to do is to, you know, is to tell them, about, tell, you know, the emperor about the coup attempt. But, um, you know, this ISS Stamets turns out to be, it looks like he's going to, turns out to be a little bit Weasley in this episode, I think. So, yeah, I, I think the key thing there is that we know what his price is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. everyone's got a price. And of course, you know, in a happy world, people's prices are good things, right? Like, uh, um, I'll free my prisoners if you free your prisoners. You know, that's a, that's a happy, yeah. you know, re resolution to the problem. Um, as opposed to the, I'll free my pri prisoners if you kill your prisoners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or in this case, you know, I think Stamets could have been bought off with uh, science. I'll give you access to better labs. I'll give you more resources. I'll give you those spore things you've been looking for. Mm -hmm. As we mentioned last week, it seems like both Stamets are very dedicated to their work. Mm -hmm. This one. Uh, we also find out that it was a transporter accident during an ion storm that sent Lorca to the other to the other universe yep. so maybe that's what happened to our Lorca. maybe our Lorca got switched right he should have been if that's what happened that's what happened in the original series that sounds like a switch yes but That'd we still don't know what happened to him uh he then asks the uh iss stamets uh to show him the bio weapon that uh that he's been using or that he's been uh creating for the emperor and uh, he uses it to take out a few decks so that's not good we cut to the throne room and burnham asks the emperor if, if she can contact her ship but uh Giorgio says no she's pissed and doesn't trust burnham and has her sent to the brig but burnham isn't having this as she steals a gun takes out a couple of guards and swoops out of the throne out of the throne room 
The emperor then, not following Burnham's advice, sends some troops for Lorca. We then cut to Saru, who is giving us a captain's log. And I know it's not our first captain lo captain's log of the uh, show, but this one made me really happy anyway, you know? So Saru, no matter what's going on, is doing his due diligence. I love it. There was a review I found on Slash Film that had this to say about uh, Captain Saru, and I really liked it. It says, I've been waiting all season for a captain to fill the void left by Giorgio. She had all the elements that made my favorite Star Trek captain, uh, the next generation's Captain Picard, so awesome. She was patient, stern, yet fair, compassionate, and knew how to get the maximum out of her crew. She was just the best. I had hoped that we'd find someone to carry on her spirit and legacy, and it looks like the right person for that job is Saru. Saru had studied under Giorgio longer than Michael, and while Michael quickly out paced him in terms of daringness, Saru mastered Giorgio's ability to responsibly wield power for good and not for game. Do I think that Michael could make a great captain? Sure. Do I think now is her time? No. And as much as I love Michael, she's just too impulsive. And that impulsivity showed once again that she made one of the most careless decisions uh, someone with Vulcan, Vulcan training could have made. Oh, and that decision was knowingly altered the timeline by bringing back Mir Georgiou. So, that's fun. In, in uh, last week's After Trek, of course, uh, Jonathan Frake said that he was uh, such a good captain because he had been a first officer first. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I love that. That was a great moment. Also back on the disco, we find out that Stamets, uh, the mycelial crop is all but dead. Stamets worries that his ISS version may have gone too far with the damage it was done. Then Stamets and Tilly show Saru what the mycelia are uh, being used for in the ISS universe, and it's to power the captain's mighty ship. Or city, depending on what you call it. They've, it's been called both. They say that whereas they glide along the network... The crew here uses the power uh, uses it to power the entire ship, and that's what's killing off the mycelial, as it is draining power from the network. It isn't even it isn't able to uh, 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 recoup itself. The damage will cross not only into both of our universes, but across the entire multiverse, eventually destroying all life as we know it. Jim. <laughs> On the Emperor City, uh, Lorca makes an announcement across the ship. He tells the crew that the Emperor is not strong enough to keep the aliens out of the Empire. He also tells everyone that Burnham is not to be touched. She is integral to all of this. Giorgio has found out that Lorca is lurking in the labs. She then announces to the throne room that she is in charge here and not him. She then takes a gun and a battalion to get to him. Commercial. Back to it, the Emperor is the uh, first to enter the room. Uh, they find her security chief, who uh, was kept alive because she has a message from Lorca. She says, and then it's disintegrated by a phaser blast. Then eight red lights from guns pop up. Lorca turns the corner asking, did you miss me? Then one of his group fires at Giorgio, but the field, but a force field keeps it from hitting her. But she's got hidden guns, hidden in the wall. They start firing at and takes out a bunch of Lorca's group. But then Lorca and Landry take out the guns. They fire enough to wear down the force field. A firefight breaks out on each side. The Emperor's group losing too many and she is forced to emergency beam out. You didn't tell me she could do that, Mr. Stamets, says Lorca, pissed. Landry continues saying, we might as well kill him now, but Lorca asks if he's able to disable the emergency beam out protocols. Uh, I can do that. Naughty nod, nod, nod. <laughs> and at Jeffries too, Burnham is trying to communicate with Discovery, and she is finally able to make contact. I thought this little exchange was interesting because he says, uh, or she says, it's good to see you, Saru. Responses, it's good to see you, my friend. It's funny that with all the differences that they started off at the beginning of the show on uh, yeah. 
on the Shinzo that now he's calling her my friend. Mm -hmm. I like that. Uh, he asks about the captain, and then she reveals to the Discovery crew uh, all about Lorca. Stamets puts it together, much like you and I did last week on the show, that Lorca changed the coordinates and that uh, reading the uh, tech from the 133 jumps, he was able to put together the uh, map to get home. Now Stamets tells Burnham about the mycelial power source. Their plan is to shoot a torpedo into the drive, but they could never, uh, and that should sever the power source to the mycelia network. But Tilly has bad news that there's a containment field around the mycelia, mycelia and that uh, it needs to be taken down. So Burnham decides she's going to OB-1 that containment field and take it out. <laughs> hey, have you heard about the new uh, tk 14 <laughs> Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Their moment's better than the, uh, the I think they were tk 48, whatever. They're yeah. better than the TC-13s, <laughs> yeah. for sure. Burnham tells the ship to uh, stay in warp so that they can't be boarded, and she will contact them when she is in place. Burnham Lorca uh, preaches on about he's, how he is the personification of fate. Everything that has happened to me has happened to a reason. So it's interesting. We get this. Uh, this happens a lot throughout this episode where we hear Lorca talking about uh, destiny and fate and how, you know, everything that he, everything that's happened has happened for a reason so that he could take over as the uh, emperor of this uh, other universe. So how do you feel the, about all that? The Vikings were a people who believed strongly in fate. And one of the things that it did for them is it allowed them to be maximally violent. Because if your death is fated and there's nothing you can do to change it, you can't hide from it by being safe, but you also can't get killed earlier than your time by you know jumping over people and going into battle when you're not ready because you're not fated to die yet. You're capable of being crazy, right? Of being a mm -hmm. berserker because well, you're not fated to die yet. So just go, go, go. Yeah, And if you do die, well, it was your time and there's nothing you could have done to avoid it anyway. Which sounds like a, a perfect lifestyle for the uh, people in the mirror universe, don't you think? That's right, yep. Crazy. Lorca then thre uh, threatens Stamets again. Uh, he's going to open up this uh, thing in the floor and dump Stamets into the mycelial network. And for a moment, you think there's hope. You think, hey, maybe Stamets being put into the network can contact our Paul, and he can tell you how to take down the shield. Or maybe in the network itself, he could figure out a way to stop the mycelial from dying. But then Lorca says, just kidding, I hate poetry. And Landry <laughs> kills Stamets with the, with the phaser. <laughs> it was so fun. Then Landry gets a buzz on her communicator, which is funny because it makes a sound which is similar to our communicator in the original series, but just different enough that you're like, oh, that's from the other universe. I get it. But uh, Landry finds out about the ship-to-ship -ship communique that Burnham had uh, launched, and Lorca says, uh, sounds like my Burnham. Commercial. Back to it. Lorca finds Burnham, and they have a tete-to-tete, uh, -tete, you know. Marines. Lurka calls uh, the Federation back home a social experiment doomed to fail. Every opinion is not equal, he says. This is uh, some of the uh, heavy-handed politicalness that we were uh, discussing before the show uh, starts. No, not every everybody's not equal. Uh, sounds a little bit like what we are hearing from uh, uh, a few people in our government. I won't say the entire government, but Lorca then continues to offer uh, Burnham a place at his side. Landry doesn't find Burnham where she's supposed to be because she has rerouted the feed. But Lorca is still sure that Burnham will come to him. Burnham does find Giorgio, though, in her sanctuary. Giorgio continues to think that Burnham has been seduced by, Lorca, by this Lorca. But Burnham tells her that Lorca thinks everything is destined to happen. But her f future is not going to be determined by him, she says. So I also wrote here, these are two very uh, Star Wars-y ideas, too. This idea of fate and destiny, right? We hear a lot about that in uh, especially Return of the Jedi. 
uh, but also in uh, The Last Jedi as it just came out. And I think it's interesting because for her to also say that the uh, that the uh, uh, future is not being determined uh, very Star Wars -y. again, as we see in Return of the Jedi, Luke decides he's going to defy what he what everyone else says is fated to him. He's not going to destroy the uh, his father and the Emperor. He's instead going to you know embrace love. And then the same thing happens in you know the Last Jedi with uh, with uh, uh, Ray saying that about Kylo. You know, saying that like. The biggest the, the mistake that Luke had was believing that his destiny was already, you know, sealed for him. So I thought that was interesting. Two little Star Wars ideas showing up in Trek, which I guess isn't a surprise considering, uh, you know, the whole JJ Trek was kind of based on the, you know, the Star Wars ideals anyway as well. Back to it, you know, Burnham says that both versions of me have betrayed both versions of you. I'm not going to let that happen again. I'm going to stop Lorca. And then Giorgio says, uh, I can see why he likes you. I almost believe that you, uh, that you can do that. But of course, we also find out that the controls for the containment field are in the throne room, right? Which leads us to this in inevitable, <laughs> destiny, right? Inevitable. The inevitable face-to-face -face of Lorca and Burnham. Back on the Discovery, Stamets and Tilly uh, talk to the crew about how we're going to destroy the mycelial grid. They need to use what's left of their mycelia, put them into warheads, and shoot that into the core. The problem is they won't be able to jump home. Tilly also says, our shields won't be able to hold the blast from the network. They're not going to make it out. So I wrote a note saying, you know, either way, you're dead. You might as well die, you know, saving the entire multiverse, right? That sounds good. But Saru comes up with a better line, via Ted Sullivan, saying, it is well known that my species can sense death. I do not sense it today. And he goes on and gives a, a really nice Starfleety speech there. That is definitely sure. Discovery is no longer Lorca's. She's ours. And today is our maiden voyage. <laughs> I also wrote, uh, guess our guess as to who will be kept in captain next season is right on target. Burnham and Giorgio arrive, uh, uh, Giorgio arrive on the uh, bridge, or the throne room. Uh, Burnham's pretending to deliver Giorgio here to... Uh, to Lorca. Lorca. She goes, you can have me, but you have to let my crew of the Discovery lives. This scene is awesome. There's so much tension building. Giorgio threatens Lorca. She says, I am destined to kill you. <laughs> Lorca turns to Michael and says, Welcome home, Burnham. Commercial. Back at it. Tilly thinks that she's found a way out of the explosion. It's basically to ride the wave of mycelia out of the explosion, uh, out of the, uh, the aftermath. Stamets takes it one step further and says, hey, I think that uh, I'm going to be able to activate the warp drive. That will provide a second layer because of the warp bubble. Uh, it'll be a second layer of uh, protection from the explosion. And with Lorca's coordinates, I should be able to get us to jump home. At first, I thought maybe Lorca, or maybe um, Stamets here is a little bit nervous about getting back into the spore drive because apparently that's going to be part of the plan. And uh, I wouldn't doubt it, too, if he was, if he was scared. But then uh, Stamets gives a very Kirk-like uh, line when he says, I don't accept no-win scenarios. Then Discovery receives a message from Burnham with her security codes, co codes saying it's okay to drop out of warp. So they drop out of warp. But then Lorca calls the ship. He says to them, my admiration for you is sincere. You are not going to die today because Burnham has agreed you has agreed to be by my side. <laughs> Saru saying, I'd like to hear that from Burnham herself. You are not a reliable source. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that awesome Saru. He's taking command of the ship in the greatest ways. Burnham says, uh, Saru, I am here where I need to be, which is a great sort of coded message. Then 
Giorgio and Burnham, Burnham take out the guards. Boom, boom, boom. Saru fires on the throne room. Explosions happen everywhere. Then we get slow-mo Giorgio. And she's doing all sorts of damage, putting guns to people's heads. Then her and Lorca fight while Landry and uh, Burnham fight. The brawl continues. And then we see Lorca has, you know, uh, has Giorgio tied in. There's a knife and it's pressing further and further to her face. And then out of nowhere with her right leg, she kicks him in the face. (laughs) I was like, what a crazy kick. I mean, we all know uh, Michelle Yeoh is a famous martial artist in the movies, but uh, that was awesome. I really love that. Got to be careful, though. I think you could pull a hamstring doing that thing. <laughs> so uh, Lorca then gets a knife in the back, care of Giorgio. Uh, he throws it back at her, but she then again kicks it away like it's like she's using the force or something. Lorca and Giorgio fight by the throne. He takes her down, but not out. Because Burnham enters the fray. Ooh, the tension mounts. Don't make me kill you, he says. And again, I wonder, did he have to kill the other Burnham? What happened? We don't know. Uh, But she finally gets the drop on him. Boom, kicks him down. She grabs a phaser and, oh, is this the end of Lorca? One final scene. But of course, Burnham can't fire on him. We would have helped you get home, she said. Had you ask, because that's what Starfleet is. And that's why I won't kill you, she says. But I will, says Giorgio, oh, and Lorca gets the sword <laughs> right in the gullet from behind. behind. <laughs> and now, and now, Giorgio, and now, and now, here, we see why the panel was shown to us earlier in the show. Not just for the joke with Stamets, but so that we knew what was happening to Lorca as he is dropped into the mycelial core. Which now begs the question. Is, Dan, is uh, Lorca's uh, brain now in the core? Is he alive in the core? Could it be? Could be a force ghost. <laughs> yes, he comes he back, comes as, a back as a force ghost. Exactly. <laughs> Giorgio knows that she has nothing left here. She says she has shown her neck and that she will not live long, but she will die on her feet. She tells Burnham to go and find a way home. As Burnham calls for discovery for Beam Out, she sits looking at Giorgio and decides, eh, might as well bring her with me. She couldn't allow another Giorgio to be killed. So she grabs onto Giorgio and they beam over to the discovery together. So I want to talk about this transporter trope because this is actually something that has bothered me since Star Trek IV. Because, so first of all, Everybody stands, Everybody stands in their, in their own, own little, little like transporter, transporter pad, pad, right? Right. Yeah. And they're beamed over. over. And then whenever they're beaming up, they always say, one to beam up. So, why isn't the computer? I mean, obviously, there are answers to this, but like, do we need to know that? Like, can't you just be like, hey, beam me up? You know, Scotty, beam me up, you know, and beam up and then just take however many people standing in one cell as you need. Like, it's just weird that. In both those places, one to beam up, and then two people come aboard. It's not how do they not just get mashed together by the computer? You know, that's like that's just a crazy thing. It's always bothered me. On the discovery, black alert. Stamets is in the spore drive, so he's in the spore drive after all. They fire their torpedoes, and they hit it. <laughs> Warp drive engaged. Spores fusing with the warp drive. Spore drive engaged. Oh no, but they're having a problem. The pathways are bifurcating too quickly. And in his previous vision in the spore drive, Hugh told him to listen for the music and to open his eyes, and that will get him home. And Stamets does. And this almost felt like a death scene. I was a little worried for Stamets there for a minute. But no, he's alive. On the bridge, everyone breathes a sigh of relief. Back in the spore lab... We see that there are spores everywhere, including one green spore that lands on Tilly's shirt. What is this? Is this the return return of of Lorca? Lorca? (laughs) Stamets tells her to reset the system and see where we are. Cut to the transporter room. Giorgio on the transporter pad suddenly speaks. What have you done to me? She says. 
on the bridge. Stamets tells us that we are in our Alpha Quadrant. Everything looks good, but uh, it's nine months later. Saru asks for the uh, for the war map to be brought up, and it appears that the Klingons have won the war. Dun dun dun! Credits. And that's the end of this episode, folks. It was all so crazy. My goodness. So what do you think this means now? Going into uh, the Klingon, you know, we got the... So the Klingons have almost won the war. We're nine months in. Are they going to be able to time travel back? That's a question. Who knows? What's going to happen? What do you think, Ken? Prediction. So, of course, we got a little, you know, next week on Discovery. Uh And in that... They encounter another Federation ship who arms weapons, shields up, not being friendly. And then they get boarded quickly before they get their own shields up. And it's Sarek and Admiral Cornwell. And I th- yep. it, it gives you the impression without saying it, you know, clearly, you want to know if Lorca has been dealt with. Like they've figured out on their end what the <clears> Lorca <throat> situation is. That's interesting. And so maybe they have the real Lorca. You know, maybe the real Lorca has showed up in the intervening nine months. Oh, that'd be interesting. I don't, I don't know what the, I don't know how it works, but they seem to know that Lorca's the problem. So it seems like they're there to establish that Lorca's gone. And my guess is that once they're, they're clear that Lorca's done with, uh-huh. then they're basically going to, okay, well, Saru, you're the acting captain. Here's the situation. We'll brief you, get you up to speed. Making Glad Michael number one, you know, isn't weird. Because he yeah. can vouch. We know that Dingens like to vouch. Yep. <laughs> like Star Trek 6. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, one of the other funny things on, uh, uh, you said it before the show started, and uh, it was true in just a little bit that I saw, but uh, Jason Isaacs is quite the character, uh, you know. Uh in that episode of After Trek. But one of the things I liked is he called uh, Burnham Lorca's fatal flaw. Mm-hmm. I thought that that was really nice. Like, you know, he's like, that's what he said. That's what makes it Shakespearean. So that's good. I like that. Um, that's all I got on this episode. How about you? Anything we didn't hit? Anything else you yeah. want to talk about? Yeah, so I got some thoughts. Yeah, hit me. So previously, they had talked about in, in After Trek about how they wanted to make clear that the future, the more utopian uh, Roddenberry future, was not a foregone conclusion, that it was something we had to work for, that we weren't quite there yet. It was going to take effort. And so mm-hmm. our characters were going to have to struggle through things. And um, But on this episode of After Track, it was very clear that what they're thinking of in terms of the mirror universe is the phenomenon that we're seeing throughout the Western world, whether it's alternative for Germany or um, Le Pen in France, Gert Wilders in Holland, the five star movement in Italy, the fact that Poland and Hungary, which had previously been in a very much liberal democracies after the fall of the Berlin wall are now kind of, right-wing semi-dictatorships. We've got Trump in America. We've got uh, Abe in Japan. So, you know, there's there seems to be a, you know, I, what they're thinking here is kind of a mirror universe, right? This is, this is what we signed up for. It's not what we thought we were getting. Um, the problem, I think, because good storytelling has to let the story rule, mm-hmm. right? You know, if you... So, for example, Tolstoy would write out the best possible characters for all his different positions. And he did not know who would win, right? right. And so as, as he was going, he would then go, well, this guy's got the better argument. He's got to be the guy who you know, prevails. Rather than deciding in advance, well, this is the ideology I like best. <laughs> this is the guy whose worldview is most congenial to my own. Therefore, he's the hero. And he's going to overcome problems. <coughs> just because. And so, you know, my concern is if you are too, you know, of the moment and responding just to what's going on right now, 
you end up making the story weaker and you can sabotage the rewatchability once once things have changed. Mm -hmm. So there are some episodes of the original series with like space hippies yep. or you know those kinds of things which are the least universal, the least rewatchable in the sense that you watch it and you go, oh it's classic trek, it's universal, it speaks to me now. Instead you're like, oh look, they made this during the 60s. Have fun. Yeah. And of course what you really want are you know, to go back to that question about how the utopian future is not a given, it's not a foregone conclusion, we have to fight for it. And the more generalizable those problems are, so, you know, the ancient philosophers on politics, the Roman philosophers on politics, the Renaissance philosophers on politics, the founding fathers, the enlightenment, 19th century guys, the people who had to confront, you know, fascism and communism. We're aware that there are problems with democracy mm -hmm. that need to be resolved, that, you know, it, um, crowds are to be feared. They need to be constrained by the rule of law, by systems that slow down decision making. And so I, I, you know, I worry about to what extent they have put all their chips, they've gone all in on a certain kind of Roddenberry utopianism while imagining that they are writing a script that is, or a story that is about a, you know, a kind of generalizable struggle when in fact they've tricked themselves. So I don't know how it's gonna go. But since they brought this stuff up and talked about it in the last after track, I'm, I wonder, because it, it's, you know, uh, as, as Fenneman said, the first rule is not to deceive um, yourself, and you are the easiest person to deceive. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's clear that these guys <laughs> don't like the 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 political moment that we're in, right? And maintaining your objectivity right. in storytelling, and being able to Tolstoy like not decide necessarily who's right and who's wrong to be able to acknowledge the problems with democracy, to, for example, be able to say, you know, so I think it's easy for us to, to go, oh, look at the way uh, Trump invigorates the left, right? The way he creates enemies. Mm -hmm. And then it's also the case that the left does the same thing, that they create their own enemies by going over the top um, you know, by basically saying, uh, you know, if you aren't with us, then you're against us, and we have to denounce you as racist and homophobic, and you know these kinds of things. That they're both creating their own enemies, and is the liberal order, right? That if you only look at the one side and you ignore the way it, you know, to have anti-fascists running around with clubs and black shirts and helmets you've got to have this other side, right? You're not, these guys aren't just running around, you know, as innocent, good, you know, good guys. It's, it's because there are bad guys on both sides and what's at risk. And this is the way it was in the thirties, right? You see this conflict between communists on the one hand and fascists on the other and everywhere, mm -hmm. the liberals lose. The liberals lose in Italy, the liberals lose in Spain, the liberals lose in Germany. The only reason the liberals don't lose in France and, and Britain was because they were so long established as liberal democracies, you know, both of them having their origins really in the 18th century, that you know, they just weren't ready to fall yet. But they had their own fascist movements and they certainly had their own communist parties. France, in fact, did fall in the war. It you know, lacked the ability to resist the Germans the way they had in the previous war. The 30s is not a happy time for liberalism. And when, when you forget how fragile liberalism is, that it really requires people acting against their own self-interest and thinking about you know, how, how we have these systemic benefits when we don't fight for our ethnic group or our religious group or our local community against all comers or you know, exclude the new guy or exclude the foreigner or exclude the outsider, exclude the person who's different in this way or the other way. But instead, 
make the bet that if we're inclusive, if you know, if we almost embrace the Vulcan idea of, uh, you know, infinite combinations and infinite diversity, then that's when we'll be, in the long run, the most successful. Because that temptation to go for the short run benefit of excluding the new guy, because that way we can preserve what we have right now, is tempting. It's the it's like the ultimate risk to liberalism, right? Is that people fall into their narrow camps of identity politics and abandon this the universalism that lies behind liberalism in its classical sense. So to bring this back around to Trek, the question <laughs> that I have, uh, I mean, so if, we, if, if you're saying that the idea of dictatorship on Star Trek is something that may not last 10, 20 years from now, then I would question, I mean, don't you think a di dictatorships are something that'll be around for always? I mean, isn't, isn't oh, yeah. the dictator the thing that we should always be fighting against? Yeah, so you have the episodes in... Uh, which which we've watched, like the one where the uh, the theater guy had been the guy in command of the planet, and uh, there was starvation, and he didn't know that food was, you know, days away, and he engaged in the mass killings. Right? The there's a series episode. Right. So there's <laughs> you know this story of dictatorship of the king. Sorry. Right. You know, so but that was a kind of a universal story. Right, mm -hmm. while it was built out of people's familiarity with the '30s and the '40s, because these guys had all been through it. Right. You know, it didn't. It didn't feel. For one thing, it didn't feel like it was a problem of the '60s. Right. It was a, right. a more universal. It had been digested and mulled over and generalized. So yeah, I mean, I, I would find it very plausible that if the Klingons are winning that the Federation is at risk at home, right? Mm -hmm. That um, whether it was political parties or the, or the military or you know, guys like Lorca, that without necessarily being a mirror versions of themselves, mm -hmm. right? Are going to push for greater and greater. You know, there's somebody who made sure that... Um, you know, Article 14 was Section 14 or, yeah, Section 14? Section 13? What's the secret section where the spies show up in, in uh, Deep Space Nine? Section 21? I section I forget now. But that section thing, right? And they, they say that, you know, in the founding, there was this idea put in there. It, it's crises are always the, the moments where people seize power. Right, and this is a crisis. If the Klingons are winning, if the Federation is going right. to lose the war, it would be a credible, credible argument to make to say we have to sacrifice some of our values in, in order to preserve what's left, right, and to defeat the Klingons. Because Klingon, this is you know in a sense the ultimate Machiavellian problem. Machiavelli himself was a Republican. He hated dictatorships. He was tortured by the Medici, and yet he writes The Prince, right? And it's a mm. conundrum. Why would this guy who in his personal life as a diplomat serves a republic and is a, a Republican guy write this book about this very cold, you know, hard politics? And, you know, part of it is you have to be willing to do what's necessary to preserve the state. So if the Florentine Republic had been maybe a little bolder at this moment, or a little bolder at that moment, and had resisted the Medici or or Caesar Borgia or you know these other these outside threats. Perhaps there would still be a Florentine Republic in Machiavelli's older age, rather than the Medici having coming to power and casting aside the, the Republic. So these kinds of problems. Yeah. So those problems are universal, right? And so mm -hmm. if you write future scripts in terms of this universal problem of how do we preserve this utopian vision that, that Roddenberry gives us and recognize that there's a certain fragility to it, but it's really only cultural. It's true because the people accept it to be true and that it would not work if you suddenly populated 
you know, lots of people with mirror universe people because they just had the wrong set of values. Mm -hmm. And if those values are called into question, if people have abandoned the values of the Roddenberry utopia because, well, the Klingons are winning. It was a social experiment and it didn't work. We need to do something different, then that would be very bad. Well, and it looks like, too, that might be some of what we're going to get because it looks uh, like Giorgio may have something to uh, help us with. <laughs> When it right. comes to defeating the Klingons next week, you know, her uh, stepping up and being like, oh, I can show you how to bring them to their knees if you want. So yeah, very well, get both sides of that argument uh, <laughs> next week. Anything else you uh, want to get to before we uh, sign off for this week? Nope. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, that'll wrap us up for another great episode of the show. Hope you all enjoyed. As always, you can follow us on the Facebooks. We got, uh, we're got we on SoundCloud. We're on iTunes. We are on the YouTubes if you want to see what we look like and see what we're doing as we're sitting here talking to y'all. This will be the place to do it. All right. Well, as always, my name is Matt from Austin saying farewell. And as always, say goodbye, Ken. Live long and prosper. And we will see everybody next week.